Um, I will talk about uh, reinfections and not about SARS-CoV-2 reinfections, but by the other coronaviruses. Um, the reason why I tell this story um, is because I'm actually not really a true coronavirologist. I'm a virus discovery person. So I started with virus discovery in the early 2000s after a career in HIV research. And uh, the first virus I found was Human Coronavirus NL63 in 2004 was published. And um, well, of course, the first virus you find, uh, you, you do a lot of research on. So I did years of research also on coronavirus NL63 and uh, also continuing with, with other uh, virus discovery. And on, on NL63, um, uh, as, as mentioned, a lot of uh, some, some years of research. Um, I looked at virus transcription, evolution, link with disease, uh, burden of disease, the receptor. So NL63 is also using uh, ACE2. Uh, point, uh, so it's also using ACE2, um, the same receptor as SARS-CoV-2 is using. And um, I looked at early infections. And when COVID came, I looked at susceptibility to reinfection. So I... I did a lot of full-time research until 2012, and then with COVID, I continued again with, um, with looking at coronaviruses. And I will present today about these early infections and the susceptibility to reinfections, and I will also have some, some overview of what's known from the old literature. Um, which coronavirus can be studied regarding reinfections? Then that total is five. There are five coronavirus that can be studied. Those are four uh, seasonal coronaviruses. They're mentioned already in the previous talk. NL63 and 229E are from the genus alpha coronaviruses. OC43 and HK1 are from the beta coronaviruses. And there's a fifth one, which is an animal coronavirus, also an alpha coronavirus, and that's feline coronavirus giving a mild disease when it's not causing a feline infectious peritonitis. The human coronaviruses were found in the 1960s, well, two of them, 229E and OC43, and NL63 and HK1 in the uh, mid-2000s. And, um, and those are the four we have. There, there are many groups tried to find with universal PCRs, tried to find more of them. Uh, these were the, the four we have, and then SARS-CoV-2 will now be number five. And I have here this, um, these 229E and OC43, which are found in the mid-1960s. And in the 1960s, the common cold unit was active, one in UK and I think also one in US. And, um, and there they did um, of, uh, inoculations of volunteers. And this is one of the very early uh, publications on 229E, the alpha coronavirus. And here they inoculated 26 volunteers. 13 of them developed a cold, 50% uh, so uh, got symptoms. And this is an overview of the symptoms. Here you see that, um, uh, that, they, uh, that they use a lot of handkerchiefs, which means runny nose. They have, often have a headache, uh, pyrexia, um, sore throat a bit, well, sore throat, half cough a bit, a typical common cold. For OC43, this is from a paper from 1993, summarizing all kinds of volunteer studies with OC43. Uh, and here they, they measured the, the symptoms um, um, in time. So in, on the XS X, there is the symptoms in time, one day, two days, three, four, five days after experimental infection. Um, and you see stuffiness of the nose, sneeze, sneezing and mucus increase in the nose. This is the sore throat, which quickly is going down, and some cough. So OC43 and 229E are um, common cold viruses. These viruses were also isolated from uh, people with common cold. So um, it is uh, very likely that the same symptoms were scored. Uh, but then, are these the very first infections? Is this infection of a person being naive to the virus uh, and then these are the symptoms that, that can be encountered. But actually, it's not. Uh, because these, in, these infections, we all get uh, at early, uh, at early, uh, in early childhood. This is uh, serology. 
uh, date, sorry, serology data from a person uh, followed from birth. So this child was followed from birth until 24 months of age. Uh, there were blood samples collected and they were tested. And here's the ELISA signal. They were tested in ELISA specific for the four seasonal coronaviruses, 229E and NL63. And here I show the results for two alpha coronaviruses, 229E and NL63. So the children start with some antibodies from the mother, then they decrease. And here is an infection with 229E. You see the antibodies go up. And here the antibodies go up to NL63. So here, and at these two moments, there were infections by 229E and NL63. And in total, we looked at um, 25 children that were followed that way. So we had regular blood collections over 20, roughly 24 months, and we could score when the children would seroconvert for, um, for the different viruses. This is the table for uh, coronavirus NL63. And here you see the age at which they seroconverted for the virus. So the majority seroconverted, and it, it, it could be very, very young, and it was also could be when they were 20 months of age. For 229E, that's this column. There you see that it's uh, rare, only five of the 25 seroconverted. For OC43, it was very frequent. The majority seroconverted for OC43, and about half of the children zero converted for HK1. So infection occurs early in life. And this was confirmed by a study from a Chinese group who did a cross-sectional study. And here you see that at age four to six years, you see that the plateau is reached for 229E, OC43, HK1. And all children have had their first infection. So every infection that we would monitor and look at the at symptoms is actually a reinfection. So what occurs when we get a reinfection? So these are the four viruses. What happens with a reinfection? Because that can say something about SARS-CoV-2. Well, of, of course, we already know what we can see with the reinfection for OC43 and 229E, because that is what was done in the 60s and this 90s and in this common cold unit. These symptoms, they are all from reinfections. What we don't know is what would happen for NL63 and HKU1, because they have not been inoculated into volunteers. And uh, we studied that for all four viruses in the Amsterdam cohort studies on HIV infection and AIDS. Well, this sounds very HIV, but actually these are healthy, uninfected persons because the Amsterdam cohort study consisted of two arms. Uh, one arm was HIV positive and would be followed to see how the disease is developing. The other arm was HIV negative and was followed to see if the people would seroconvert for HIV because these persons had risk behavior. They were men having sex with men. Um, the majority of this HIV negative arm never seroconverted for HIV, which means that they remained healthy from the start of the study on. And the start of the study was already in 1984 and 1985 when they were included. And every three to six months, a blood sample was drawn. Um, there was a gap in follow-up between 1997 and 2003. That was a period where there were hardly any HIV seroconversions in the Netherlands. So the study was halted, but after 2003, it was continued again. For all these um, people that were uh, followed, um, the symptoms for an influenza-like illness were scored because an acute HIV infection looks like an influenza-like uh, infection. So cough and fever and sore throat, et cetera, was, uh, was all scored um, via survey. So the, the persons were asked what kind of symptoms they had had. Uh, we used again as an ELISA, the same ELISA as I showed for the children. So we have specific ELISA using the C-terminal region of the nucleocapsid protein of, of these viruses, which is the most specific region. And with that, you can distinguish between the two alpha coronaviruses and the two beta coronaviruses. And we knew when there was an infection because then there's a 1.4 rise in antibodies and that we determined via um, an ELISA looking at measles virus. So this is uh, all the follow-up samples uh, of the individuals that we are, had under uh, investigation. And then we looked at the fluctuation of the levels in antibodies for measles, the persons were 
uh, vaccinated for measles. And here you see that there is hardly any fluctuation and never above a 1.4 rise in, in antibodies. And this is what we saw for the coronavirus. So large fluctuations indicative uh, that there were infections. And this is then how it looks like in these Amsterdam cohort studies. This is on the X axis, there's the follow up in time. So it starts, this person starts uh, a bit after 1985. And then in red is the levels of antibodies for NL63. So here's an infection. Well, here an infection occurred in the period before the blood was drawn. Here's another infection and another infection over here. Here's a 2 to 9E infection. And here's another 2 to 9E infection. You see that there's a bit cross reactivity, but there's always one which is the highest. And so it's easy to distinguish if it is cross reactivity or a real infection. Uh, here's an example of an, uh, another person, some NL63 infections. Here a strong 2 to 9E infection, a strong OC43 infection and some HKU1s. Um, here, another example. Um, and here, I think is another one here you see um, also, yeah, nice repeated infections with, uh, with NL63. And, um, and in total, we did uh, 37 of those persons. So 10 in detail, which we published, uh, I'll show later, published for reinfection, but that will come later in the presentation. For 37 of those, we did um, a score for those symptoms. I mentioned already that there was this survey for cough, fever, sore throat uh, in the period prior to blood collection. And we uh, determined what the association was with the, with the, uh, with the uh, rise in antibodies. And here you see uh, that there's indeed a significant association between reporting symptoms and this rise in titer of antibodies. Here is OC43 and 229E, of which we know by the volunteers that they cause these diseases, and indeed there's an association with symptoms and our rises of, uh, of antibodies. The same is found uh, perhaps even stronger for NL63, an association with fever, cough, and myalgia. Interestingly, we do not find an association with HKU1 infections. And I must say, we also do not find HKU1 infections very often. So only 39 here, while the other ones are uh, way, uh, way more frequently found. So we are a bit in doubt whether our assay is good enough. So we're now making uh, uh, additional assays to see what's happening with HQ1, whether this is really the odd one out uh, or that our test is not good enough. Uh, then a bit uh, about seasonality. Uh, it's not about climate, I must say. We had this nice presentation about the climate change and, and what this could mean for, uh, uh, for infections. But um, the, the temperate, we have a temperate climate in the Netherlands, uh, which means we have uh, moderate to, to quite a lot of rainfall uh, across the year. We have mild to warm summers and we have cool to cold winters. And sometimes we can do some ice skating uh, on the canals. Um, then we looked uh, in the, uh, what, when we saw an, a rise in, in Titer, then we looked which months were, uh, in, uh, we, were prior to this moment of uh, blood collection. And then we saw that uh, this was very often the months of the winter. So here you see for NL63, it's December. And here are the months, January, February, until December. So NL63, very high in December, but also very high in January, February, March. Same for two to nine E, very, very high in the early years, uh, early months of the year, uh, OC43, high in November. Um, and, um, and well, not, not so strong um, uh, um, a signal for HK1, as mentioned, a bit the odd one out. Um, then going to reinfections, how fast can you get another infection? We know now that all these NL63, HK1, all these infections are reinfections. We have seen the virus before, we get a reinfections and sometimes there's uh, association, but how fast can this occur? Because then you know for how long somebody is protected from infection by the same virus. 
in uh, in in we looked at the 10, 10 subjects and we in that we had 50 reinfections that were in continuous follow up so we could look at the interval between the two infections and then we saw that for some there was already an infection after six months that's those three infections two times two to nine e and one times oc43 and reinfection the interval was even more when we took nine to 12 months. Then we also saw several two to nine E infections, two NL63 infection and one OC43 infections. So these infections can already occur six months to 12 months after having had an infection. And uh, I'm, as I mentioned, these are the data already published. The data about the total 37 uh, are not published yet. Um, then uh, the fifth virus uh, we can look at, uh, this is, I will be short on this, but this is the feline coronavirus. And there's only one study on this, but it's a beautiful study. So I want to mention it. It's not mine. It's published in, uh, uh, in 2000. But this is a study on uh, one household with 26 cats, which were followed for 10 years. And uh, an amazing continuous um, blood collection of all 26 cats. And they looked at antibodies for feline coronaviruses in time. And they de determined also the titer. So it's a really an amazing study. And I took the data from that study and put it here in the table. And every uh, letter here from A to Z is one cat. And this is the follow up in time. And here you see that the cat has antibodies for feline coronavirus. And here there's a full fold rise, which means that there's an infection going on. Here's another full four fold rise, another infection by feline coronavirus. And here another more than four fold rise. Uh, so another feline coronavirus infection. Re two, uh, three uh, reinfections in this, in this, did I say child? It's the cat. Um, uh, but uh, and and this occurred in se for several uh, se several of the cats. And here we could also look at the interval between them. And it's here it's eleven months and one child, one cat. Uh, it is uh, it is six uh, uh, six months even. Um, so from this the conclusion: uh, natural infections by human and by feline coronaviruses can occur already one year post infections and sometimes it's even shorter. Of course, everybody now that we also see the Omicron variant wants to know if this frequent reinfection might be because we have different, different types. Are there different types of NL63, of OC43? And indeed there are. So this is the... Um, uh, phylogenetic tree for NL63. And here you see that there are two types. And he, these are two, two strains which are isolated in 2004. And these are also from 2004, indicating that there are two types which are co-circulating. The same for HK1. There are two types. These are from 2004, 2005, but these are also from 2004, 2005, also here two types that are co-circulating, indicating that you could, it could be that you, one year you have an infection by one type and next year you get, you're vulnerable to an infection by the other type. Same for OC43, two types, perhaps even more, but they co-circulate. So this is 2004 again, and here you also see the other branch is also from 2004. So they co-circulate. Only difference is two to nine E. Here, there's only one type, and this one type is showing genetic drift. So it is only continuously evolving, but there's only one type. So if you take a sample from 2004, it will always be that same type. And you can even, by sequencing, say, when you have something in your freezer, by sequencing, say, from what, which year this 2 to 9E was, uh, uh, was isolated. So this is very intriguing. This might actually look the most like we're now facing with SARS-CoV-2. And the nice thing is also that 2 to 9E is used the most in these, uh, in these uh, challenging um, or in, uh, experimental infections experiments uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so this last part of uh, my presentation will be about experimental challenge and rechallenge. 
uh, experiments, not data that uh, that I generated, but uh, but this is a small overview of the old literature. Uh, and uh, and I must say, uh, I went as a detective to find all kinds of clues when certain isolates were uh, were uh, uh, were found, and um, and that's what I will present. So it's experimental challenge and rechallenge with two to nine e, um, and uh, and it uh, some. Well, two groups looked at homologous uh, challenge and rechallenge. So there was infection uh, in one year. People got ill. They were uh, administered and they were asked to return 12 months later, and then they were infected by the same strain. And these strains could have been from uh, more or less the period uh, that the, the person also was living in. It could also be. Uh, that there was a, a challenge and a re-challenge, um, and it was heterologous. Uh, so challenge with one virus and then re-challenge with another virus, but it also always had to be that these viruses have been taken, um, uh, ha had been collected, had been isolated years apart, because otherwise you cannot have heterologous strains, because the only difference in strains is when they are from different periods in time. So a re-challenge with a heterologous virus for 2 to 9 is always an old virus and a recent virus. What also was done was a homologous challenge and re-challenge with two times the old virus. And, and this is then uh, the summary of viruses uh, used in, these, uh, in this old literature. And uh, I mentioned already, I went through all the uh, old uh, papers to really find out when a strain was uh, was first isolated. So there are two very old viruses. Uh, VR740 is the prototype one, is also the virus that you buy at ATCC when you buy uh, 229E. Um, LP is also an old one, it was isolated in 1965. And then PR and TO, KI and PA, PA are um, like, a, well, you can call them new viruses. Uh, still, they, they look quite old because they are from the 1970s, but they are actually new viruses because the volunteers that were inoculated were inoculated in the late 1970s or perhaps early 1980s. So these viruses were the ones which were close to the ones that were circulating when the uh, persons were challenged with the viruses. Um, so these are then the studies that have been done. Uh, this is a homologous challenge with LPLP, so two times old, because that's the 1965 strain. Um, the homologous challenge with TO and TO, which is recent strain, because this is from the mid-1970s. And there was the heterologous challenge uh, with uh, one of these strains and one of these strains. The paper does not indicate which strain was used in the heterologous challenge, uh, but this contains uh, old and new, and this also contains, contains old and new. Because it says heterologous challenge, it's probably always a combination the, of old and new, but it can be mark. old and new. I'm almost finished. Um, this is what was found when they did a, a, a challenge and a re-challenge with uh, two old viruses. Then they saw that, uh, so the, in, the, in the first challenge, nine people got ill. These were asked to come again. They were re-challenged with the same old virus. And then six people got infected, which means that there, were not, there was no protection. But importantly, there was no disease. So there was infection, there was RNA that could be detected, the antibodies went up, but there was no disease. Um, this is the re-challenge with the recent virus, which means the, the virus which was also the, the current virus in the 1970s when also the volunteers were living. And then they could not re-challenge them. So there were six persons who received TO, were, got sick, got antibodies when they did the re-challenge also somewhat 12 months later, then none of them could be infected. And of course, also no symptoms. Then the heterologous challenge, also 12 months apart with old and new, and then five of the eight could be infected and they, uh, these five also had symptoms. And then there was one bonus, and that's this one which is a strain called PA, and this PA had, the, had, had 
unusual culture conditions and in, a, in such a way unusual that if we now look at it, it may very well have been an NL63 strain uh, at that time. Um, so a challenge with PA, which might have been NL63, I pointed it here in gray, uh, in green, and uh, then KY on top of that 12 months later, also gave no protection. So another species, uh, not even that far away, NL63 e does not provide protection uh, against infection or disease. And with that, I end with um, uh, the final conclusions. Um, uh, these experimental infections with 229E, they show that you become vulnerable when the second virus that you receive is from a different type. Well, it, of course it is as expected. And of course it is like we are now seeing with Omicron, but it's beautiful that it's, uh, it, it has been done at least once by an experimental infection. Um, we see more vulnerability in this re-challenge when the second, well, like I mentioned, the second virus is a different variant, but it's important to uh, realize that this vulnerability to re-challenge with the homologous strain um, um, is, is, um, is way less when it's the same as the currently circulating viruses. If we now translate it to SARS-CoV-2, then we could say that we, we are in the vulnerability when, we, when we're talking about two times old virus, because we're not used to these viruses yet. And with that, I end. Um, Grateful to the people in my group, Arthur Edrich coordinated all these ELISAs when they had to be done in a rush in 2020. And of course, I'm really very grateful, grateful to the Amsterdam cohort studies and the volunteers that went for these decades uh, to the municipal health service to donate blood. And I thank you for all the attention. Good. Thank you very much. and. Uh... Opening up now for questions from the attendees. Yes, um, yes, uh, Mala Maini. Hi, hi, Ben. Great. Interesting work. I'm, I'm first of all, wondering if you've got any cells on any of those kids, because it would be great to look at their T cells. Uh, but also, has anyone looked to see, I mean, it's very difficult, obviously, to look at the epidemiology of these viruses now because of all the um, measures with masks and social distancing. And, but um, if one, if there's been a selective drop in the frequency of the seasonal coronaviruses compared to other causes of the common cold, um, say in this autumn and winter, which, which you might expect because of the cross-reactive protection from all the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. I I, uh, I think you're asking uh, if if I expect that that uh, the the dynamics may be different now because we have had two winters of social distancing and masks and whatever. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying obviously they are very different, but I'm saying as a result of all the infection and vaccines that we've had and some cross protective immunity that we'd expect between SARS-CoV-2 and the seasonal coronaviruses. I wonder if you knew anything about the epidemiology of whether there's been a, a selective decrease in the incidence of the seasonal coronaviruses as the cause of common colds compared to other causes of common colds. I, um, I'm, I'm in doubt whether SARS-CoV-2 and the immunity elicited by that virus is would ever give protection uh, to, to the common cold coronaviruses because uh, it, there is not even heterologous 2 to 9E to 2 to 9E protection within a year, I must say. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, it will be the first months, but, uh, but this will wane very fast. So I'm not expecting that SARS-CoV-2 will, will provide this cross protection. I am thinking that all the masks provided uh, the massive protection. So, so the, the, the seasonal coronaviruses really had a difficult time uh, the, the last uh, two years. And, and your first question, if we have cells, this Amsterdam cohort study is, is uh, always meant to do uh, massive research for HIV. So T cells were stored of, this, uh, of these people, yeah. 